So uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Simon Huggard. I'm uh, Deputy Director for Research and Collections at La Trobe University and welcome to our webinar about promoting ORCID to your researchers. Um, so I'd, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of CORL, uh, but the, this, this presentation is a, a jointly sponsored by CORL and by ANS and by the Australian Access Federation. Uh, we've all been working together to ensure that we have a, a number of uh, activities going on that can help people implement ORCID at their institutions. So um, the Australian Access Federation are leading the uh, ORCID consortium and they'll be presenting today. Um, and we've got a number of presenters uh, also from different areas who will be presenting about promoting ORCID to uh, your researchers. Um, and if, you're, if you want to tweet today's presentation, that'd be great and use the, the hashtag hash ORCID. Uh, that'd be really good. Um, so in terms of uh, our speakers today, we've got quite a lot to cover. And this webinar will probably go the full length. We'll probably finish at about 20 past one. And that's when we'll have some uh, questions at that time, so it may go on a bit longer depending on the number of questions. Uh, if we don't get to all of the questions at the end of the sessions, we'll, we'll cover those and we'll send them to the presenters and they can uh, send some responses back to, to, everyone, to you uh, in answering your questions. So we're covering five uh, different areas with five different uh, speakers. So I'll be uh, presenting um, just some basic sort of ideas about ORCID and what we're doing and how you can promote uh, to your researchers some basic messages that you can use. Uh, then Natasha Simons from ANS will be presenting through about uh, an ORCID record, what it looks like, how you can look, link that up to uh, different external sources. And then we'll have uh, Milroy Almeida from the Australian Access Federation who will be talking through some technical things and what you can do to uh, access support from the Australian Access Federation. Uh, then after that we'll have Julia Hickey from the National Library of Australia who will be talking about ORCID and uh, how ORCID is integrated into Trove and what that looks like. And then at the end, uh, the last session for the, uh, for the webinar will be Scott McWhirter from the University of Technology, Sydney and he'll be talking about uh, researcher engagement at UTS. So, so I'll go through, I guess, some things around ORCID and, and um, some basic messages. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I guess um, what we're doing is we're ANS and the Australian Nexus Federation and CALL are really interested in promoting, uh, providing resources that you can use to help you implement ORCID at your institution. So, uh, this webinar is really a, a one of, uh, we're planning a series of these, so we'll see how we go, but we've had a lot of, uh, you know, interest in these presentations and we'll be putting uh, as much information as we can uh, in a place where you can uh, you can access that, and uh, if other people have, uh, I guess, information that they're using to promote ORCID to their own researchers, we'd like you to share that with us as well and put it on a website where everyone can see that, because that helps everyone be successful in their implementations. So, um, our webinar today is all about sharing knowledge about ORCID and demonstrating success stories and what you can do and giving a, giving a basic introduction as to how ORCID uh, can work. So uh, as I said before, the AAF are the lead agent and they're here to uh, help with some of the technical aspects of that uh, to get you going. So issues around uh, authentication, uh, integration with uh, different systems at your institution, uh, configuring the ORCID side of things so that can work properly with your, your own institution and and there's you know, quite a lot of options that can be done on the ORCID side of things to integrate with your, your own system. So they can help you with all of those sort of aspects. Uh, and why ORCID? I guess let's step back a little bit and say, well, why are we all talking about ORCID and why is, what's the ORCID consortium all about? So the ORCID is a, a globally recognised um, uh, group, I guess, and they really um, are the leading organisation in terms of uh, researcher identity management and they're, uh, they're, I guess they're becoming the, the sort of de facto standard I suppose for, uh, researcher, for researchers to be able to identify themselves with an ID. So ORCID have, I guess are an independent organisation, they're funded by us, they're funded by all of the institutions, all the different uh, publishers and academic institutions and or other organisations who are wanting, who are working towards the same goal, I guess. So we're all working together to 
make sure we can identify our researchers properly and do it in a, a systematic way and a connected way. So ORCID is really good in the sense that they're, um, they're, they're working towards the same goals and with our consortium and with others, it means we can all work to, together towards those same goals. Um, so ORCID um, have been working with consortia around the world. They've been, um, they've been signing up consortia at different, different um, country levels and working with different research organisations to make sure that, that ORCID is connected into all of those organisations. And they, so that includes universities, it includes uh, consortia like ours, uh, it includes publishers, uh, research databases, all sorts of different organisations that um, are dealing with uh, research, research management. And they, uh, they've put in a, you know, a really big effort, I guess, to ensure that there is proper uh, system integration with all of those outside systems. So things like uh, research management systems, um, publisher publisher management systems, uh, researcher databases, all those kind of, kind of things. And so with those deep connections and those really good connections with all of those different outside systems, it means that it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to implement ORCID you know, ourselves across our different uh, organisations. And I guess another uh, sort of really important thing to think about is that, it's, that they're really supporting our own institutional goals. Um, so the issue of research integrity is a really important one for our institutions. Um, the issue of asserting that an author is an author of a publication and that they belong to a particular institution and the institution can also verify that assertion and therefore there's good deep connections between what researchers are doing and their outputs and the actual provenance behind it, which are, is an important thing uh, these days in terms of just being able to count and properly uh, recognise people's research outputs, but also making sure that, so for, with data, for example, uh, the data that underpins a research paper um, is actually, you know, the integrity is there in that we can assert that these uh, investigators in a particular uh, project were actually the authors of that information and they and the data that underpins those those papers is actually their their data that they gathered and that's their intellectual property. So that, that's a really important thing uh, these days. But I guess uh, another one is around uh, recognition of, of research outputs to make sure that those authors, everything's properly accounted for. Um, and then there's the issue of discovery and impact in that uh, because global is, uh, because ORCID is a global organisation, uh, it's going to have a global reach and therefore that uh, helps with the discovery of people's research outputs and also the impact of the research that they're doing. So I guess that then leads into what are the key messages for researchers? Why should they be actually getting an ORCID and why should they be uh, listening to, what, to all of us about what we're trying to do? So uh, ORCID is all about having an identity that can easily identify who the author is and not uh, so it's that issue of disambiguation, so you're the, the correct John Smith at your institution that authored this publication is a really important thing. And uh, for, for researchers, it's, uh, it's important to let them know that ORCID can stay with them throughout their academic life. So if we get them early when they're a high degree research student and they're writing their first paper, it can follow them no matter where they are. If they go to another institution, it can go with them. And the more effort that our own institution puts into that connectedness means that uh, we can help with that assertion as to where they were when that uh, paper or whatever it was was, was authored. And it, I guess it also helps with uh, different formats and variants of different people's names. If they've changed their name, if the way their name is stated on a paper, uh, on one paper is different from another, it doesn't matter, they can still be uh, identified properly. Uh, so therefore, the other, the other, another important one is around time saving. So we know researchers are very busy. Being able to manage their ORCID record with the proper information in it and having that connectedness to all of the other systems and identifiers enables them to be able to put that information in there once and therefore as they publish and as new, inf new uh, information goes online, it's properly uh, managed and connected and they, you know, it, it helps them report that information once and it's all connected into all the different systems and that's got to help them. Um, so ORCID connects with researcher IDs, with Scopus IDs, with these knees, with Crossref, all those different other systems are well connected into the ORCID uh, ecosystem and so therefore it's very easy for them to 
uh, link up those identifiers and therefore always be up to date with their, their publications and other, other research outputs. And then I guess um, yeah, uh, even funding bodies are part of that ecosystem. So the NHMRC want people to put ORCIDs into their system when they're applying for a grant and therefore that's all connected up in terms of affiliation and attribution and connecting up of what they've published uh, with their grants. And so that's important for the, the researcher themselves in terms of recognition and discovery of their uh, research outputs. And so um, ORCID is a very big system. There's already, uh, I think, over 4 million ORCID IDs that have been assigned to researchers and it's a really big and important system for people to engage with and that, that global scale helps with discovery and impact. Uh, and then the other, I guess the other things around key messages are uh, affiliation and integrity. So again, it's asserting that affiliation is really important and all of our institutions are uh, wanting to make sure that our, that we can count people's publications and research outputs easily and this, uh, that's one of the hardest things for us to do. So by having ORCID IDs connected up properly, that makes our lives easier and it makes uh, it much easier for researchers to be able to assert those uh, you know, that they're an author of a publication or a research output or some other uh, work that they can link in. And it, it gives them recognition if they've had grants awarded to them. Uh, other awards that are affiliated with their research output, that can be put into their profiles and, and give them recognition. And I guess one thing is that ORCID's not just another system. It's not a fad. It's not a social network. Um, it's not something that's going to go away. It's fully supported by a global network of, of people who are supporting uh, the work to identify researchers. And because it's uh, part of our consortium, you know, uh, we're part of, our consortium is part of ORCID um, and our institutions are paying money and we're making sure that all of our systems are connected up to, to it. It's, it's a, a really strong and important message for people to engage with it because it's, it'll help integrate with all the other systems that they're trying to, to work with. So it's, it's not a research gate. It's not something uh, out there that may disappear in the future. It's something that's well supported and understood and across all of our institutions. And for the researcher themselves, it's, uh, it's quick and it's easy and it's free. And uh, they, they, can, they can do a minimum amount, which is just get an ORCID ID and make sure it's known and, and used and that they tell people about it. Or they can put in some extra work in order to make sure that all of their publications are in their ORCID profile. And we, of course, are here to, to help with all of that. So that was all I was going to cover. So um, what I'd like to do now is uh, hand over to uh, Natasha Simons Romance, who's going to go through what an ORCID record looks like and how it's connected in with, with other systems. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to walk through an ORCID record and um, just show you how researchers can link data sets into their ORCID record. So I've gone straight to the ORCID homepage, it's just orchid.org, and click sign in. This is a live demo, so um, I'm hoping that it doesn't come back to bite me, that everything goes off smoothly, and if it doesn't, that I have someone else to blame. But anyway, let's give it a go. Um, so there are a few different ways that researchers can sign in to an ORCID account. Uh, you have a personal account option, which is the one that I will use. You can also sign in with your Facebook um, login or your Google Plus login. And there's also an institutional account which, you know, if your institution has set this up, then researchers will be able to log in using their same sort of staff number and password that they use to access other um, accounts at their institution. So just sign in. Okay, so this is my ORCID record. Um, and this is, I, I just want to talk through some of the things. So just to sign up and get an ORCID record is very easy and only takes about 30 seconds. The question is what you do with your record once you sign up. And of course, one of the main things you can do is populate your record with your works and use it um, and promote it to, to other people as well as a way of uh, looking at uh, the things that you've done in your research. Uh, so some of the options here are you can get a QR code for your ID. Uh, it's like a barcode that you can put on different things to promote um, access, uh, just a different way of accessing your ORCID ID for people. Uh, there's a, you can fill out the rest of your ORCID record. So there's a field here called also known as, and you can use that to sort of add variants of your name. So I can put in a name variant there. 
click Save Changes and there it is. You can add your country, uh, keywords associated with your research. You can put in your website, so access to your Twitter account or a blog or any other kind of website. You can keep adding to them there. And you can put your email address in. Uh, at, at the moment I have that email address as private setting, but you can actually make it public and you can add more than one email address as well. You can add in a biographical statement, you can add in your educational background, um, your employment, and I'll just turn to the funding. So if you want to add funding to your ORCID profile, um, in the future when you apply for funding, some funders are working so that they will be able to write your grant back into your ORCID record. So you apply for funding through Wellcome Trust and you authorise, and Wellcome Trust says, will you authorise me to update your ORCID record? You say yes, and then Wellcome Trust can actually write your grant into your ORCID record for you, which saves you a lot of time. And similarly for publishers working on the same thing, so that when you um, submit uh, a manuscript to a publisher and it's accepted, uh, the publisher says, is it okay if we write this publication details to your ORCID record? You say yes, and then the publisher can automatically write that information into your record. And there's another feature of that, which is that if you're an institution and you have institutional ORCID uh, membership, your institution will be notified of that changes, uh, of that uh, writing to the ORCID record so that they can keep track of what's happening with your ORCID record too. So if I wanted to add some funding, I just click Add Some Funding Now and I go to Uber Wizard for ORCID, which has about 200 different funders as part of that. And here it's saying, do you authorise Uber Wizard to um, read my ORCID record and add funding items? So you say yes. Now I don't actually have any grants, so it's not going to find any grants under my name, but I'm just going to demonstrate one. Um, I'm going to do a different search. So there's one grant from the Australian Research Council for Mark Penane. If that was me, I could tick that and add it to my ORCID profile. So I'll just go back to that. Okay, so looking at the works, um, I think I will just first show you that there are privacy settings here. So the thing is that with ORCID, researchers control their records and they control uh, the privacy settings in it and who has access to read and write to those records. And so there is a setting here, you can see that the green is everyone can see this, so in my public record everyone can see this information. Or you can go yellow for trusted parties, so only, and I'll show you who they are in a minute, and then you've got sort of an only me, so you can control the settings there. If I actually go back up to my accounts, you can see that the trusted organisations are listed here and you can see who I've authorised to uh, write to my ORCID record and read it. Um, and you can also add trusted individuals uh, on your behalf. So, um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to add Captain America at gmail.com to edit my ORCID account. That's going to say no because he doesn't have an ORCID account, so I can't authorise him to edit my email address. But if, sorry, to edit my ORCID record. But I can actually add someone else who I know has an ORCID record and happens to be at ORCID in this case, saying yes, I can authorise Laurie Hat to edit my profile on my behalf. So that gives you an idea of the privacy settings which you can change yourself, uh, you have control over that record. So just going back to adding works, um, so you can you can see in my works here that the source is myself where I've manually added something or the source here is Crossref metadata search. So um, ORCID has actually connected up to Crossref and I've authorised Crossref to write to my ORCID record and they've written in this record for me. So I've got a couple of those like that in here. I've actually removed my data set so that I can show you how to add it. And you can click this button, by the way, to see more information about the publication there. So just click Add Works and there's an option there of search and link and that's the one I'll show you today. 
So what I want to he do here is I actually want to add a data set, and this is, this is actually a real data set, it just wasn't funded, this particular research, but um, it, is a, it is my data set that I want to add from the ANS registry. So click on the ANS registry and it says, do you authorise ANS to write to my ORCID record and read it? I say yes. I'm not sure why it takes you exactly to this login screen and makes you authorise twice. That's a little bug, I think, that we will have to work on fixing. Uh, so, I, it hasn't, what I have to do now is I'm taken to um, the Research Data Australia search um, here. So, I just type in my name and here I can see this is actually my data set. If I click on this, it will open up the page in Research Data Australia just so I can check it. But I can click it and I can say import selected works and it says please review it, make sure it's yours. You say import and it, it reminds you that you can actually change the privacy settings for who's going to view that information in your ORCID record. So then I go back to my ORCID record and still showing 10 works so I just refresh there. And now it's showing 11 and the one at the end it should be is my data set. Now at the moment the, despite, uh, the default display for the type of data set when you come through the ANS registry is other but there is going to be some work on that to change it to data set. But you can actually do it manually at the moment if you click that copy and edit button. And you, you can't actually select a work category of data set here, but you can actually select it here. And so you can say uh, add to list. So what I've done here is I've copied that particular record. So you We'll have two authority records there for the identifying skill sets for repository staff data sets and one will be me and the other one will be the one I got from the ANS registry. So here I've made my change, the preferred source here to show that so it says data set by default. But we'll be doing some work on changing that so that the default is data set because when ANS was originally set up as uh, to be able to import from the ANS registry into ORCID, it was actually before they had done uh, work on that uh, to actually have data set as a category. So we need to go back and fix that. So the last thing I will show you before I hand over um, to our next speaker is there's a blog by Ad Alice Meadows on um, six things that you can do now that you have an ORCID ID and it's basically um, some of the things that I showed you, but it's really worth having a look, having a read through that because it's about populating your profile with works, um, expanding it out, using the QR code, adding ORCID to your signatures, to your uh, Twitter account, that sort of thing. So that's it from me and I am now going to hand over to Melroy. Hi everyone and uh, thank you Natasha for the directions on how to create an ORCID ID and how to add details, how to add works and funding information into it. My name is Melroy and I'm the ORCID technical lead for the Australian Access Federation. And the Australian Access Federation is, or AAF as everybody knows it, is the current Australian consortium lead for ORCID. So the best way to get in touch with us is at support.af.edu.au. Uh, that's great, but you want to use support at af.edu.au. It's because as consortium lead, what we do is we provide support to all the members of the consortium, which is almost all the universities within Australia at the moment. Uh, journal timings, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and uh, ORCID also provides support, but the consortium support is during Australian hours as opposed to uh, generally whatever is the time in Hong Kong. It is always in your regional time. And then another thing is we have more of a regional focus, so it's all within Australia. We've got the knowledge on what member institutions are currently doing with their integration, 
whether they're planning, testing, if there are a couple of members who are doing something similar, then we try and get them to speak to each other, effectively connect the dots. Uh, why do you want to be a consortium member? It's because of the fact that you get premium membership, it comes at a reduced cost, and you have the ability to integrate ORCID into multiple systems. So what does the consortium lead do or what can we do for you? Well, we can provide assistance with planning your integration. So as a member institution, you've decided that you want to take the next step, integrate ORCID into your systems. You get in touch with us. We can help you plan your integration. Uh, what we also do is those members of the, cons of the consortium who have already done their integration, uh, we actually document those integrations when possible, uh, create use cases and then we just disseminate them to members. We also provide tier one support as I discussed and yes, we also act as a conduit between consortium members and ORCID, which means if any of our consortium members have any issues with ORCID or if some of the systems aren't working properly, anything like that, we just effectively escalate it to ORCID if it's something we cannot solve in the first instance. As for training, we do a lot of training for the consortium members. Uh, we try and organize a uh, number of workshops during the year. Some of them would be virtual, some of them in person. Uh, we also introduce the ORCID support staff. That would generally be me and a couple of people, a couple of others from the Australian Access Federation. What are the channels of communication you can generally use? Email is great. In fact, it's the best channel. Best email again is support at aaf.edu.au. The only reason I ask you not to send an email to me personally is because if I'm not at my desk or if I'm not in work that day, uh, chances are it won't be answered. Whereas if you send it to support, somebody from the team will be able to answer that question for you. Uh, another thing is what we do is ensure ORCID messaging advice and support is consistent throughout the consortium which means as members, as and when you integrate ORCID and you communicate with your researchers, what we'll ask you to tell your researchers is exactly what ORCID would be telling you to do, especially with the guidelines around how you use your logo, how the ORCID logo is used around branding. What we say would be exactly the same as what ORCID would be telling you. We also help you develop a local support FAQ if that's what you want to do, and yeah, we provide assistance with that. So when in doubt, always ask for help. Easiest way is, once again, support at aaf.edu.au. What do you generally do and who to contact? So what the organization members, so institutions would do is effectively get in touch with us as tier one consortium lead. And effectively, the questions that we would answer is how to do the integration, what sort of integration are you looking at doing, what other members are doing. We'll help you troubleshoot your integration if there are any technical issues. And then if you want to engage with your researchers or if you want resources that tell you how to do that sort of stuff, we'll be able to provide you a link to it or help you develop some of them. What we will escalate is stuff about accounts data that's private between a researcher and ORCID. So we won't have access to it, so we directly escalate that off to ORCID. If you have a really unusual workflow that nobody's ever done before, it's probably something ORCID might need to look at and actually work with you. Then if you're using new features, for example, something like peer review, uh, that's there in the latest version of the ORCID API, but it's not yet a stable version. So if you're using something like that or plan on using something like that, then it's probably something you'd have to escalate. And if you get a really, really complicated error, that case, we would again escalate it over to the ORCID support. So there are a lot of self-services self -service resources currently available. Uh, there is a link to each of them over here on the slide. And what I'll do is once the webinar is over, I've already got a PDF copy of all of these links along with the resources. And I'll try and send it out to everyone who's registered for the webinar. Well, again, as usual, any questions at all regarding ORCID, what the consortium lead can do, if you're looking at doing an integration, please give us a call, let us know. Uh, we're more than happy to help you out with it. The main way to get in touch with us is support at aaf.edu.au. Generally from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Mondays to Fridays, we are available. 
uh, even if it is after these hours, we try and respond to it as soon as possible. But yes, cool. So I shall hand it over now to Julia. Thanks, Melroy. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, Trove's integration with ORCID. We're now, we've been doing it for a year. Um, and if we talk about ORCID being one of those enter once, reuse often, that's the great thing about it. Trove is one of those reuse often cases. So this is the people and organisations zone in Trove. If you haven't met it before, it's where we collect together records describing people. We set up a container for a single person and bring together all the records describing them from different institutions and systems. So here's an example, Marcia Langton. Records about her exist in four different systems that we work with. So we bring them together here in one big Marcia Langton container. The container does useful things like it connects all her system identifiers for other systems to reuse and that's behind the scenes. But for a user, it also brings together bits of information like biographies, publications that she's authored um, and related people and organisations. Now we have a small but constant demand from modern day authors and researchers to be able to take control of this Trove profile, to update the record, to write their own biography and we don't have a local system capable of doing that. So we send them to ORCID. They need to set up a profile there and then they need to start using it. So that means including it when they submit articles for publications and ideally in their university's institutional repository if that's possible. I won't really go into the how, just know that Trove relies on a slightly complicated web of systems to try and identify just the Australians in ORCID. DOIs are the key across all those systems, so when researchers have good metadata like DOIs in their repository record and the matching DOI in their ORCID profile, then Trove will find them. Or even better, if they include the full ORCID URL in repository publication records, we'll go straight out to ORCID and grab their record. So what are the benefits for researchers? Well, number one, they get a presence in Trove. If you're not Marcia Langton and you don't have records describing you in four systems, you might be someone like Alex Brown here, then setting up an ORCID will create you a record in Trove. When I checked last year, about 90% of researchers we get from ORCID were new to Trove, so that's really important. Setting up an ORCID, making yourself Australian will get you into Trove. They can write their own biography. It doesn't have to be extensive, even if it's only brief enough to distinguish them from other people with a similar name. Trove auto-generates this list of resources. It thinks that this researcher wrote based purely on author name. So if someone has a common name like Alex Brown does, it's generally not going to be stuff they've actually written and we know that researchers themselves find that really frustrating. If they have an ORCID, then Trove will replace that list with the definitive publications from ORCID. So that includes when they've moved institutions. Uh, we also love it when they include keywords. These get roughly translated into occupations and it helps people who come along in Trove looking to find researchers in a certain field. Uh, so we encourage people to include information like their education and employment and as Natasha showed us earlier, if they give the right permissions then institutions can actually do this on their behalf. But when they include that in their ORCID profile, it makes a researcher even more findable both to users and to their colleagues. So here's a search in Trove that's limited to people from UQ that nominated diabetes as a research field that they're working in. Someone might conduct this search if they're another researcher in the field, if they're a journalist looking for a comment, if they're staff from a government department, a, post, a postdoctoral student, you just, there's quite an extensive list of people that are looking. But whoever it is, more information in their ORCID record makes the researcher more findable in lots of systems beyond ORCID. And this is one example where people are looking in Trove. 
We're also really keen for people to include grant identifiers. So if they've received a grant, particularly from the ARC or the NHMRC, um, those organisations want to know that their open access mandates are being met. They want to link the people they gave grants to with publications. So entering the grant ID on their ORCID record can mean less work on reporting for everyone involved. We've also seen some really cool stuff happening with funder grant IDs in Trove recently. So here I've done a search for a grant number in Trove. It's showing me the people who worked on that and nominated it on their ORCID profile. And on the right hand side you can see that Trove's also showing the publications and data sets that came from that same grant number. So all from the same search just of the grant number. So I guess the key message to take back to researchers from Trove is that if a researcher has an ORCID, they take care of it, they use it, uh, they water it in their greenhouse, then one of the benefits will be that they take control of their profile in lots of other systems. Trove is just one of them. Now, that's, it's all great and I, don't, I want everyone to take that back, but I don't want to sound like I'm just hard selling. There are, there's a bit of a reality, reality check. It's not all sunshine and beautiful flowers. We know that what Trove gets is skewed. So we've got about 12,000 Australians from ORCID today. They're predominantly from the physical sciences and education, and there's a real lean towards medicine. Um, these are the top 10 keywords that researchers nominated as their fields. Trove, the way we've set up the system, has a really tough time finding humanities researchers. We don't have real-time updating like we should. Once a researcher initially comes in, the records only update once a month, and we know some researchers find that frustrating because they find their profile in Trove, they specifically go to ORCID to update it, and then they don't see their results straight away. And finally, our Australianness test is quite rigorous. Um, we initially didn't have it, and we were vastly overwhelmed with foreigners. So that test will skip anyone that doesn't set up their education or employment fields, or specifically name uh, one of the Australian universities or research institutes in their biography. But our ORCID integration is a success story from our point of view. I've just written a blog post about our experience one year on. It's meant less work for us. It's meant much more correct data in Trove, but also much more correct data in lots of other systems. And it's a great way for a researcher to get their profile out, to have it be correct, to take control in many more places. I might leave it there and hand over to Scott. Hi everybody, um, thanks Julia. My name is Scott McQuerta, I'm at the University of Technology Sydney and I'd just like to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing over the past five to six months. Um, we've had a, an interest in, in disambiguation of research data that has stemmed a little bit from uh, an experience we had with our name, uh, we had a comma in our name and that meant that essentially quite a lot of our data was being delimited in the major aggregators and so we changed our name. So we take that uh, disambiguation problem fairly seriously. We also have a high proportion of staff who have uh, a common given initial and surname combination and you can see on the right hand side of the screen here this is the, uh, the top publishing authors at, at UTS um, and there's some fairly common combinations there. We also, uh, being a technology university, have quite high coverage rates in uh, the ORCID integrated sources, so in Crossref and, and in Scopus. And we work with two research management systems that are downstream from our, our key students and staff systems. So we do experience some persistent duplicate problems that we think ORCID can help with. Um, and both of the systems that we use have some degree of, of integration with ORCID, so we're, we're kind of in a good position to, to do something quickly. So we had a bit of a think when we heard that the consortium was in the offing and we came up with a, a few projects uh, that we'd like to undertake. One was aimed at getting us to 500 users inside Symplectic, one of our uh, core systems. Um, the next to 1,000, 2,000 and then eventually at some time in the, in the distant future to have the research effort at UTS uh, well described by, by ORCIDs. 
So I'll be talking mostly about this fairly small project that we ran late last year. And that uh, kicked off October 1 when we took out an institutional subscription ahead of the consortium subscription. Um, we did that because we, we weren't quite sure how long the consortium uh, would take to, to get over the line. And thank you to everybody involved. It was a, a relatively painless exercise from our perspective. Um, one of the things we, we wanted was for the orchids to be used inside one of our systems. So it was kind of important that they people just didn't go off and get an orchid, but it was actually used in anger somewhere. Um, as a byproduct of the project, we wanted the academic community to broadly understand what ORCID was, um, and we also wanted the administrative community to understand what the opportunities were for, for ORCID. Um, because of the time period that we were running it over, uh, we decided that we wouldn't run it as an especially collaborative project, that it would be largely driven by the research division. We um, just really concentrate on this single system, and that's because it was going to run over the break. So what worked well, um, certainly signing up the senior executive early, so the, the, the um, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, uh, many of the ADRs, uh, the deans, um, and, and giving them some merchandise seemed to be pretty very effective in, in them becoming strong advocates for, for this small change program that we were undertaking. We also got a list of uh, orchids from orchids of people who had UTS as an employer or in their education background, and we directly emailed them with uh, a simple one-pager of how to establish the link. Um, we have a message of the month, so we, we uh, took the January message of the month, uh, which in basically involves uh, uh, an email footer that's standard across all research division emails. Uh, we used the large screens in every building, put out general university notices, a DVCR email, and the weekly funding opportunities newsletter for, for every week in that month had a standard description of what the benefits were and uh, how to get to a single one pager about establishing an orchid and linking it into the product. Uh, we approached the ARC and NHMRC applicant lists through direct emails. We changed the login screen to Symplectic to offer training and to indicate a kind of running total of where we're up to. Um, and we did some targeted workshops in some areas of the university that we thought would benefit directly. And I have to say that one of the things that was uh, kind of instrumental was that the publishers started mandating during the lifetime of the project. So this is the uh, adoption at UTS, and you can see this is largely the period for the project. Um, so you can see it's a nice steady uh, adoption over the period. And the period since has got a gen more gentle gradient. We're not really marketing at all. Um, and you can see as to who has gotten an orchid. Um, if you ignore the fairly small divisions at the end here, it's who you might expect, so science and health, the people that might gain the most benefit. Um, uh, arts and social science is well represented. They were running a profile project that we piggybacked. Um, Engineering and IT were very, had very low penetration rates for the majority of the project, and then when IEEE announced its mandate, they, they jumped up. Uh, and law and DAB, where you'd suspect that, that marketing this type of change might be more difficult, has proved to be the case, and we've got a bit more work to do with the Graduate School of Health here at UTS. This is just a, a picture of the login screen. Into um, so indicate, indicating that the, the integration had been done, um, what the key benefit was and, and where we're up to with uh, the assistance of training and uh, uh, setting up, a, uh, registering an interest. So the things that didn't run so well was that during the lifetime of the project, we didn't really have remote access set up to this key product very well, especially for Mac users, so it's now been fixed. Uh, we also didn't have a standard place in the, uh, the academic profile template, external profile template during the lifetime of that project, and that would have been helpful. So the next project that we've just been funded is to assess which other systems um, will use ORCID um, to look at the integration pathways for those systems, and we'll certainly be getting some advice from Melroy. Uh, familiarising our central IT services with 
with uh, ORCID and maybe the API, but I don't think that will be especially required given our approach. Um, certainly developing a much more coherent approach and uh, across all the support divisions within the university. <coughs> and beginning that, that much longer process of integrating ORCID into the, the actual processes of the university around recruitment and induction. And that is, I think, all. So I think I've managed to get us there on time. Oh, well done, Scott. Um, so the first question is really a comment that as someone's interested that ORCID recognises Scopus ID and researcher IDs and asking does that muddy the waters suggesting all three are interchangeable. So just to answer that one straight off that um, Scopus is obviously an Elsevier identifier and researcher is a Thomson Reuters identifier whereas ORCID is actually publisher agnostic. So you might be interested to know that the code for ORCID is actually based on Thomson's researcher ID and that Thomson and Elsevier are both members of ORCID and key supporters of ORCID. Um, so it's just sort of regardless of which publisher you use, uh, they are likely to ask you for your ORCID because it, it's just an independent number, um, an independent identifier, independent of those publishers. Um, there's another question of how does UberWizard source the grant data and the way they source it is you actually have to contact UberWizard if you're a funder and then they sign you up to the program. What I'm not sure of is how current the UberWizard data is. So when I did my little sort search for um, some of the ARC information uh, and NHMRC, I don't think it was picking up the latest year of ARC and NHMRC grants. So yeah, do any of the other panelists, Melroy, do you know more about that or is that up? I think with NHMRC it was from 2002 to 2014 and ARC was up to 2011. But that was what I could see on the Uber Research website itself, uh, that ARC and NHMRC are part of their funders list, but they don't have all the information. So I think it's probably, if we need them to do it, then it's ARC or NHMRC who may have to get in touch with Uber Research and send them the supporting data for it. Okay. So if there's anyone on the line from ARC and NHMRC, if you have more information about that, we'd like to hear about it. Um, there's another question. Um, with the option to bulk import and manually add records, is there any checks in place to deal with duplicate or clone records within the researcher's profile? Uh, with that, you can bulk import records if you've got, if you export it in a BibTeX format, you can then import all your works into ORCID. However, with duplicates, if it is a duplicate and if you've got a DOI that is an exact duplicate of what ORCID's put in, ORCID will recognize it as a duplicate and while it will publish both of it in your ORCID record, you have an option to decide which one it is that you'd like to display. Uh, under the ORCID record, under your works, you have something called source that tells you what source has actually uploaded that. It would make more sense if it came from a trusted source like a publisher or a journal magazine or Crossref or somebody who actually does it because they've then asserted that yes, you have published this. Having said that, you can choose which one it is you'd like to display to everyone and uh, the duplicates just follow under underneath it. I think they're working on a way to actually, ORCID's working on a system on actually trying to keep the duplicates but mer not merge it as such but just like a tree, as like a nested sort of thing where you can just uh, drop, like a drop down box when you click on it, it just shows you all the duplicates but then when you take it up, it'll just show you the one that you choose to display. I'm not sure how far that is, but I believe it is there on their list of things to do. Thanks, Mel. Right. Um, there's a question of what metrics, e.g. citations, are included in an ORCID profile, because this would be useful for two researchers. Um, I mean, it would be, but actually that's not the function of ORCID, and they make that very clear, that they are not actually a researcher profile system like ResearchGate. They're actually talk of themselves as 
farming, they help researcher profile systems do the things that they do and it's not their function to provide citation metrics. But you can take the data from ORCID, in ORCID records, and, gen and pull in citation metrics from there. One of the examples of uh, sort of doing that is Impact Story, uh, which is a sort of researcher profile where you can, it's, it's actually built on ORCID IDs now. So you just, it connects, pulls the data from your ORCID ID and generates the metrics. Um, into your um, impact story profile. And there's a lot of other systems that are doing that. Does anyone else on the panel have anything to add about that? I mean, we talked a little bit about it, Melroy, but... With that, uh, the only thing I want to add is to be able to use systems like impact story and other research systems that look at metrics in your, I mean, using data from your ORCID record, it makes a lot of sense to make sure your ORCID record is updated and using APIs that are already available within the ORCID record, especially APIs like Scopus to ORCID, then Thomson Reuters API, so there's a researcher ID to ORCID, then there's Crossref, just by pulling all this information and automatically setting it to update it as and when you've published a work, just allows you to actually start making, I mean, getting much more usable data in terms of metrics from your ORCID record, as in you'd be able to harvest useful metrics, if at all that is what you choose to do. But it's just that you need to remember is that if the ORCID record is not as populated as it should be, the metrics won't be as good as it should be. So that goes hand in hand. So there is a little bit of stuff for either institutions to take on themselves in terms of advising researchers, this is what we need to do. Or if the institutions themselves like to update their ORCID record using the API uh, with information they have in their repositories, then that is another part they can walk down through. But effectively, it is something that they might want to consider if they're actually using alternative metrics or even just your normal standard citation metrics. Thanks. Nalroy, question for Julia. If I search Trove, my publications come up, but my name is not linked to my ORCID ID. What is Trove doing about combining profiles from different sources? Uh, I assume that means the publication records say in the journal and article zone versus the um, profile in the people zone, and that's one of the things that we would love to work on. If you have a really unique name, it will automatically do it. Um, we've just had the University of Melbourne are the first site that are giving us ORCIDs in their publication records, so that's really exciting. Um, and now that we have that data, it's something that we can think about is doing the definitive linking between the publication record and the Trove people record, but it's not there yet. Okay, now the question for you, Julia. Can Trove introduce a forced update function? Individuals can then prompt an update if they require their trove information updated from ORCID. Yes, that would be very cool. I would love to do that. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, all the work that we've done thus far has been unfunded and the National Library isn't a member of the ORCID consortium. Um, so it won't be on the cards in the next little while, I don't think. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question, uh, I think this one is probably best answered by Melroy. How much does an ORCID subscription cost? I don't know too much about it, but I didn't realise we had to pay. Thanks. Uh, with the ORCID subscription, I'm not sure what it would exactly cost because it just det it depends on the number of members that are part of the consortium and then the cost is divided equally between them. So what I'd suggest is if you do go to the AAF website, that's www.aaf.edu.au, and on the website there should be information on how much a uh, subscription would cost. Uh, seeing as we are, the subscription is generally built from, for a whole calendar year, but since we are at the middle of the year, it is something that can be worked out if you would choose this to join. Now, but again, it is something that you'd have to check on the website. So yes, if you go to the AAF website, you'll find that there is a link for ORCID, and under that there is an option which says become a member. 
and it describes exactly what the consortium is, the extension agreements that an organization needs to sign, as well as what the consortium model and the privacy policy is and the fees that are associated with it. There's also another link on that same page that allows you to compare the different memberships. So if you choose not to be part of the consortium but want to go it, go by it, as in go and get a membership by yourself, then you should be able to do that also. Although the point of the consortium is effectively to make it make the cost as low as possible for all the members while still getting a premium membership service. The okay. Yes, thank you. And just to clarify that it is free for researchers to sign up. It's just if your institution wants to access the ORCID API and integrate your systems with ORCID, then you need to join either directly with ORCID or through the Australian Consortium. Um, so it might be worth if you get in touch with Melroy and just find out some more information there. Um, there's about 10 questions in the pod and it's 1.30. Simon, what would you like to do? I think we probably should wrap up now because uh, we've been going for an hour. And what we'll do is we'll go through those questions and we'll re respond to the people who've asked them. What we'll do is we've got a document that we that Natasha's prepared, uh, which covered the, the key uh, messages we were talking about earlier to our researchers, and we can put those answers to those questions in that document as well and point to everyone to it. So I'll just read out the one suggestion um, that uh, can the text of you TS emails and other messages be shared with registrants as well. So we'll sort of take those things into account and just in terms of sharing information. Yes. And what this I'd like to see... should be fine. Thanks, Scott. Sorry. I was what going I'd like to see... Yeah, go on. I was going to introduce your work on the, um, the, the standard resource. I think that's really, really great, the work that you've done, which I imagine is what you're going to talk about. Yeah, so Natasha's done most of the work on that, I'd have to say. Um, she's done a great job pulling a whole lot of stuff together. But what we really want to see is the whole community sharing what they're doing. So, uh, yes. Scott, you mentioned different uh, merchandise you had. Uh, that's a useful thing if people can photograph what they're sending out to people. Don't send us the mugs or whatever, but send us uh, photographs of what you're doing. If there's other merchandise, like all could have a lot of things themselves. They have a little uh, sheet like this. And it's probably tiny on people's screen, but it's the sort of three easy steps to getting an ORCID ID. Uh, there's all sorts of other um, PowerPoints and emails and anything else that people are using, I think would be really good to, to share that with the community because that helps other people think about what their approach should be uh, because there are quite a few different approaches as to how we're going to do this. So if, if, you can, if people um, can send that to um, myself or Natasha, we'll uh, put it on that website and we'll send out where that is so that we can share that information. I think that's a really important thing for us to do. So I'd like to wrap up the session and say thanks very much to all of the presenters who did a great job. Thanks to all the people who uh, dialed in and listened to it. Um, and I guess there's, there's a couple of things to think about. We will think about whether we do another, this type of presentation again and sort of an update as to what other people are doing and what's happened uh, with uh, the, the consortium and, and how people are doing integration. I think in the future it might be good to hear about uh, the different approaches from institutions because there are quite different ways of doing things. So Scott was talking about the symplectic elements integration. Other institutions are doing it on their website to get people to log in and get an ORCID ID automatically. Other people are doing it, uh, getting people to go to ORCID directly. So th there's all sorts of different approaches that are being used, so that would be useful. And the AAF have a, a webinar on the 9th of June uh, called Understanding ORCID Integration. So that's another uh, webinar you can join in pretty soon to hear more detailed stuff about the APIs and how that integration works. So there will be some emails sent out about that soon. So uh, thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed the session and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>